According to the American Cancer Society, about one in eight women in the U.S. will develop invasive breast cancer during their lifetime. Now that's a scary statistic. Today we'll discuss breast cancer and ways to help you protect yourself. Hear from expert radiologist Dr. Kirti Kukarni about why annual mammography screening is the only method proven to reduce deaths and from genetic counselor Faye Ann Hathaway why it's important that women with a family history of cancer understand the risk and the benefits associated with genetic testing. Our experts will tell you about the latest in care and they will take your questions live. It's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. We're going to start off with introductions, but before we get too far into this, I have to say one thing, and I totally forgot this. I should have worn my pink tie today. You guys yes. just were talking about that as the show was starting, and I feel really bad about that. So I, apologize. I had a pink tie picked out and laid out, and then I didn't wear it. So here we go. Um, so I'm starting off uh, a little bit in the, in the hole here. So Dr. Kakarni, we're going to start with you since you're at the desk and uh, just, have, just tell us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. Sure. Thank you, Tim, for having me um, at the forefront and thank you for um, the lovely panel discussion with Faye Ann. And thank you for this lovely mug. <laughs> My name is Kirti Kulkarni. I'm one of the radiologists at the University of Chicago. Uh, we're a team of three radiologists, and uh, what we do is we read the mammograms, the ultrasounds, and the MRIs that the patients um, uh, take here. Um, we interpret them. Typically, we work behind the scenes, but if we find something suspicious, then we go ahead and do the biopsies of those things that we find. Fantastic. And Fayan, you have kind of an interesting position here. I'm a cancer genetic counselor here at the university in our preventative oncology program, and there's two other genetic counselors in our program as well. That's great. And I think just having the two of you here illustrates the team approach that we take with our patients, which, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, during the program, but I think it's very important um, as, as, we, um, as we discuss this. So let's, let's just talk about, kind of start off with prevention of breast cancer, because I think that's one thing that is a natural question from people. Um, what can what things can a, a woman do to help protect themselves uh, against, breast, or against breast cancer? Is diet, does that help? Are there things that, steps that can be taken? Um, so October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month mm -hmm. and um, you're seeing the city is lit up pink and there's a lot of discussion around breast cancer prevention. Um, but I want to just um, emphasize that the statistics or the epidemiology behind breast cancer is very harsh and um, I know people have heard this but one, almost one in every eight women um, are uh, in the United States are diagnosed with breast cancer and it's invasive breast cancer. Um, on an average every two minutes a woman is diagnosed or is told that she has breast cancer. So um, prevention and screening is an important step and we need to take that seriously. Um, when it comes to prevention, um, I think the first thing is to find out whether you are average risk or if you are high risk. Mm -hmm. um, I know people always think, oh, when it comes to a screening, uh, when it comes to prevention um, or screening, we need to do a mammogram. But sometimes that is not enough. I think the first step is to find whether you are average risk or high risk. If you are average risk, then you need to get a mammogram starting at the age of 40. How do, you, how do you find out if you're average risk or high risk? So that is a discussion uh, with your doctor and with your um, genetic specialist. Um, if you have any family history of breast cancer, especially if it's your parent, uh, your mother or, or your sibling, if you have dense breast, if, you have, uh, if you're from an Ashkenazi Jewish descent, if you have any history of prior uh, multiple breast biopsies, um, and um, if you are um, black, a lot of these uh, are risk factors that can uh, consider you as high risk. So you gave me a pretty good segue to go to Fayan to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about um, how people might know that they are high risk. And Fayan, can you share a little bit about what you do here and, and how that works uh, in the whole process? Sure, I see patients of all types, so I can see male or female patients. Um, we don't just identify patients with 
uh, a family history of breast cancer, but also a family history of unusual cancers. And sometimes that could be ovarian cancer, that could be pancreatic cancer. Um, you can even be at risk for breast cancer if there's a family history of prostate cancer. So all of these cancers can go together. Um, melanoma is also one of them. So we see uh, patients of all uh, types, all tumor types. If a patient is diagnosed first with cancer, I can see them, but also if the patient only has a family history. Also age of onset is key. So anything diagnosed under the age of 50 is considered an early age of onset. So we get concerned about um, any cancer diagnosed under the age of 50. There might be a hereditary component going on. So it's interesting, I, I was fortunate enough, I had the opportunity to talk with uh, one of our patients who is a survivor and a fighter and she's done wonderful. Her name is Erica. We're going to play a soundbite with her in just a moment, but she had a family history and she didn't, she wasn't aware of her family history because they didn't really talk about it, which I think a lot of families do that, including mine. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, a, it's an important reminder, I think, that if you do have this happening in your family, it, it's it's best to share that information. And Fiona, I would imagine a lot of people aren't comfortable with that, but it is it is important. Absolutely. The other important thing is that you can, even if you think that you don't have a family history, um, knowing how many people are in your family, what ages they are, what age were they when they died, because a family can be an uninformative family. So you don't realize you're at risk because maybe dad actually had four brothers. And so actually your family history is not informative. It's not that it's not there, it's just it's uninformative. I got you. So, John, let's go ahead and play Erica's first soundbite. This is when she actually finds out she has cancer. We're, we've got a series of soundbites we're going to play with throughout the show as she kind of goes through her journey, and this, this illustrates, I think, what a lot of women probably do go through in this process. So let's play that first soundbite when she finds out she has cancer. I remember some of her exact words, but not verbatim. But she says, it is cancer. And then instantly, of course, everybody's my waterworks start, my daughter's waterworks starts. It's just, but she's still talking to me. And then she says, um, you're going to need a mastectomy. And after she said that, I didn't hear a word she said. And Erica, by the way, is a competitive bodybuilder. You probably saw some of the trophies <laughs> uh, beside her. and. And throughout the whole process, I think she kind of used that in, in, in part because she, she's a fighter and she uh, takes care of herself and she wanted to get back to that. So uh, it was interesting to talk to her and, and, and she relays some of the emotion there too with, with what she goes through. And I imagine you see that with, with a lot of patients. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's not easy to explain to a patient, um, you know, the biopsy results. It's not easy to talk to the family members. We have to show um, uh, compassion and empathy and help them through this process. Um, sometimes the questions are about what to do next. Sometimes the question is, why me? Sometimes the questions are, was it not seen on my mammogram? Sometimes the question, uh, question is about what happens to my daughter? So um, I think when it comes to uh, prevention, there's no one formula that fits everyone. Um, I think uh, mammograms are um, recommended uh, starting at the age of 40. I highly recommend a 3D mammography, which is um, called tomosynthesis, and which gives us not just, which is similar uh, as getting a mammogram, but you have multiple angles in which the images are obtained. So from a radiologist's perspective, we just don't see one, but multiple. Uh, images and I think that helps us especially in patients with breast um, dense breasts. Um, well and it's interesting with her story too which I think illustrates a lot of things and and people can learn from this she's she's young she's in great shape she takes care of herself um, did not know she had a family history it did turn out she had a bit of a family history and and so she she didn't really think about that at first and then she noticed the lump. She was actually getting ready for a competition, so she was on a very strict diet. And she had, she said she didn't have a lot of body fat, which you, you can tell looking at her, she doesn't have a lot of body fat. And so it was a little bit more pronounced in her situation, but, um, but she immediately went to, to seek help then, which again, smart thing to do. 
Absolutely. Um, there are certain signs of uh, breast cancer that we always say have a discussion with your primary care physician or do consult a breast expert right away. Um, with, if you feel a lump or if there's any nipple discharge or if there's any focal pain in the breast, any changes in the skin, um, those are um, any changes in the nipple, um, dimpling, um, those are certain signs to be aware of. Uh, but also, um, you know, it's important to ask for help right away. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was one of the, the smart things that she did. She got right in and, and saw someone and, and got to here, actually, at U Chicago Medicine, where she was pretty happy with her, uh, her treatment. Fan, can you talk to us a little bit more about the genetic aspect? Because this was an interesting situation in Erica's case. Um, she had some family members, I believe on her father's side, like, for example, uh, uh, an uncle or somebody who had prostate cancer. She had a few different family members that had cancer, but nothing that she, that really stood out to her as something to be aware of. Yeah, so um, genetic, and we know that all cancer is genetic to begin with. So in order for you to get cancer, you have to have these random genetic changes occur in one particular cell. But we're also all born with these mechanisms to protect us against cancer. And the genes responsible for that are actually called DNA repair genes and tumor suppressor genes. And so the big question becomes is, are yours actually working or are they not working? So in high risk individuals, it turns out that you're actually born with a copy not working. Um, and the most common ones that we know are BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, and then another very common one that, um, or actually that's less common um, is um, TP53 is another uh, genetic mutation uh, but that puts you at very high risk for breast cancer as well. PALB2 has been in this paper more recently. Um, it's a PAL of BRCA2, so it looks acts a lot like BRCA2. And then there's some moderate risk genes called ATM and CHECK2. Um, there's a whole slew of genes now that we can do genetic testing for, um, all of which can put you at an increased risk for breast cancer. So it's important to know whether you carry that. And again, just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean that you don't carry a genetic mutation. Another one of the, um, I think, really important lessons is to, to be aware of your body and be aware of changes in your body. And, and she obviously found the lump, but she had a few other things going on that she kind of attributed to other things. And, and in fact, they were uh, connected with the cancer. So just be, be aware and be attuned with what's going on with yourself. If you have any questions, always see a physician. I mean, honestly, what's the worst that can happen? Then you go in and have a, a little checkup and then you go home. And that's... Um, I would like to add to sure. Fian's point about uh, women who are high risk. Um, um, we have different tools or different tests available for them. So mammography is one of the screening tools, but we have other tools. Um, the other one is ultrasound, whole breast ultrasound, and uh, MRI. MRI is the big one, and especially women who are high risk, we recommend that they should be tested with breast MRI. Um, breast MRI is not a CT scan. It is not something where you get radiation. It is safe and um, we have uh, a lot of research studies going on as well especially one is called uh, CAPS research study uh, Chicago alternate um, uh, protection um, study and that is um, what we do at University of Chicago there are newer MRI techniques that are used by which we can pick up small invasive cancers that matter so it's a little bit easier for you to see then what's what's happening absolutely great um, so we do have a comment from one of our, uh, our viewers that is uh, from Leslie says, thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. So maybe a patient, I don't know, but we appreciate the comments. And if you do have any questions also for our, our experts, just type them in the comment section. We'll, we'll get to those as, when we can. Um, so let's talk about risk factors that could actually boost your opportunity to, to or your chance of getting cancer. And these are things obviously that people would want to avoid, but there are things you do that you probably shouldn't that make you a little bit more susceptible. Yeah, um, I think having a good healthy diet, um, something where you're eating less processed food and less um, trans fat, less sugar, um, um, more fruits and vegetables, um, I think is a better, it's good for your body. It's 85% it's of breast cancers are, um, not because of genetic, are not because of family or inherited genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. They're actually 
random genetic mutations uh, that happen due to external factors. It could be the food that we're eating or it could be the stress that is in uh, our life or the cells that are going through, um, you know, are not going through the repair as they're supposed to. It might be the aging process associated with the cell. So to combat that, I think it's nice to be doing daily exercise, even if it's a moderate um, exercise for 30 minutes. Um, it's uh, ideally avoid alcohol or up to five drinks a week. Um, no smoking, no tobacco. Um, just having a good healthy lifestyle is important. Yeah, don't smoke. Or if you're smoking, please stop. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big one with everything. A um, couple of questions from viewers. Uh, this is a similar question from two different viewers. Uh, Suna, Susan asks, is there a relationship between prostate cancer in men and breast cancer in women? And then Tina said, I'd like to know this. Is my, my dad had prostate cancer. I don't know which one of you want to take that one. So I could take that one. So the right answer ahead. to that is yes. Uh, there is a link, BRCA2 uh, in particular can cause breast cancer in women, it also can cause breast cancer in men, but then it also can cause prostate cancer in men as well. Um, ATM is another one that can cause prostate cancer. BRCA1 has been shown also to cause prostate cancer as well as PELB2. Um, there's a couple other prostate and breast cancer genes too. So yes, the two are linked and it's important to know our father's family history is just as much as our mother's. So if your father does have prostate cancer, would you suggest um, that a woman come in for genetic testing or what would so you say? Usually we like to start with the person who has cancer. Um, that, that gives us the most information. If we can identify what's causing the cancer in the individual themselves, then it's easier to t offer other family members their risk assessment. Um, however, there was a study about three years ago that said that all men with a uh, prostate cancer with a Gleason score of seven or greater had a, about a 20% likelihood of being positive on a, a genetic test. Interesting. So Kathy has a question and she wants to know, uh, is there a more comfortable MRI for breast cancer, one that is more open um, for someone who is potentially claustrophobic? So there are some institutions that have open MRI. Um, we don't have an open MRI, uh, but our gantries are now, you know, MRI machines have evolved in the last few years. The, our gantry or the hole is much bigger. You don't feel claustrophobic. We give headphones and you can play whatever genre music you want and feel comfortable. And uh, the time that you have to be in the scanner is shortened, especially if you're uh, part of a um, one of the research studies that we're doing, like the CAPS or the abbreviated MRI study. Um, also, I would like to talk about another research study, mm -hmm. um, which is the WISDOM trial. WISDOM trial is, um, it's all around the United States and UFC is one of the um, collaborators. I think 100,000 women um, are, um, will be eligible to participate in this study. And I think um, um, it's not something which is, anyone can go online and look up. It's it's going to be a very good study because we, we will get to know which test is appropriate for which individual. Because there are multiple factors. Uh, there are some women who get mammograms every year, but they still have a um, interval cancer that develops that is aggressive. Whereas there are some women who get mammograms every year diligently or might skip a few years, but still are okay with a small insight to cancer. So we really haven't figured out what would be the perfect uh, or the correct strategy when it comes to screening and wisdom trial could be one uh, trial that I can think that will make a difference. Um, so it has a personalized trial uh, arm and it has a, a regular screening mammogram starting at the at the age of 40 arm. So with the personalized arm, they're taking a lot of other factors into consideration like the genetics. And I think that's important because it might tell you whether you need screening mammogram plus MRI every year, or you might need only a mammogram once a year. So I think these are important questions that hopefully will get answered um, with this trial and um, the number of deaths associated with this um, breast cancer will dramatically reduce in the next decade or so. I'm glad you brought up the wisdom study because Dr. Funmi Olipati, who is one of our, our superstars here, she's mm -hmm. a researcher, physician, uh, is heavily involved in that and promotes that. And it's, it's She is uh, the PI of the study. Yeah, it's, it's a great... Uh, a great opportunity really for, for uh, physicians and researchers to learn more. So um, let's play our next soundbite with Erica. And this, John, this is gonna be the one where she starts chemo. And, and we'll, her attitude is what I thought was really interesting in this. And she, she talks about that. Let's go ahead and play that.
on the morning of, he's driving back into town from work and his mother and I are here and I'm upstairs getting ready and I just have all types of like war music playing because I'm getting ready to battle. I actually had on this exact outfit because again, I'm, I'm ready for war. I'm, I'm about to go fight for my life. Right. Um, so I tried to get myself in a spirit of empowerment, a spirit of I'm not afraid, a spirit of I've got this, you know, I'm going to be victorious at the end of the day. Um, and that's the mindset um, I went into, I, I went with on my first day of chemo. She had just had such a wonderful attitude and uh, she's a lot of fun to be around, she and her fiance. And, and uh, you can tell that, that uh, you know, she, just, she was just going to fight this thing and, and did successfully. Absolutely. I think Erica had that spirit in her and I've seen her um, through her journey with that spirit. But not all patients have that um, in them, right? There are some patients based on whatever um, they are going through, whether it's financial toxicity or socioeconomic or psychosocial, but those are some things that bog them down. And it's our team that helps them understand that we have a great team of doctors here. We will take good care of you and we'll direct you as to what the next step is so um, yeah but and, kudos to Erica and the, the team is so important because we do have such a large team that work with these patients any anywhere from you know what you do what what other physicians do but what Fan does we have uh, we have folks that work on on diet with them we have psychologists that help them through the process it's a very emotional process and very difficult process and so there is support there and, and that's I think that's important for people to know that, they, that there is somebody there to help support them through this, this process. Absolutely, and uh, I've seen the, the the nurse navigation team, the survivorship team, they all seem to take really good, like take ownership of this and uh, help the patient, not just through the screening prevention, but also with the treatment process. And I think at University of Chicago, we are focusing on the personalized medicine piece. It has taken a lot more shape and form when it comes to treatment, because um, we, uh, we look at the biology of the tumor, we look at the genetic, um, we understand why um, you know this tumor is more aggressive in uh, black women versus white although they have the same incidence why is it that there is more mortality in black women when it compares when it when compared to the white women and this disparity is where we are trying to answer the questions we kind of know some of the factors that affect it. mainly it is the biology of the tumor the genetics and also the um, availability of health care um, but uh, uh, UFC is um, definitely there for them. So I've got a couple questions from viewers that I'm going to combine because they, they connect a little bit. Uh, from Suzette and Tina. Suzette asks if there is an age to get screening if you have family history. And then Tina also just asks, um, do you teach and encourage uh, self-breast exam? Is it a good way uh, to have early detection? So. Um, Self breast exam is something that is not uh, currently not in the guide, federal guidelines, but um, I usually say you can have a, your self exam. You know your breast the best. Yeah. If you feel that there is any change um, and you feel a lump, do consult us. We'll do an ultrasound. We'll do a mammogram. Go um, if you go uh, meet your primary care physician or OBGYN. Sometimes they do a physical exam first and then they send uh, the patient to us. So. Um, um, absolutely. If that's the, you know your breasts the best. Yeah. Fan, uh, Suzette's portion of the question, age for screening if you do have family history, is there a time when you should start thinking about that? Yeah, so first it depends on if you have a genetic mutation because you can start screening as early as the age of 25. But as a rule of thumb, we try to say that start um, 10 years younger than the youngest breast cancer diagnosis in the family if that happens to be younger than 40. Great. So if you have a first or second degree relative diagnosed at 35, then you would start at 25. If you have one diagnosed at 45, then you would start at 35. Great. So Erica had a, a mastectomy. She's done quite well. She's back to competing in, in bodybuilding. Um, we actually went to the gym with her and shot a little bit of video, which made me feel really bad about myself. <laughs> but uh, she's, she's fantastic. And you know, one of the things that she said that she learned out of this was really to, to live life to the fullest. And John, can we go ahead and play that, that clip? You can also live life more abundantly after a diagnosis. Like your life doesn't have to stop with your diagnosis. 
I honestly feel I'm living life better today than before I was diagnosed. Does, um, okay, so again, a great attitude. Uh, another question from a viewer, do, do dense breasts, are you, are you more likely to have cancer with if you have dense breasts? So dense breast is something that um, you can find when you get a mammogram. So we, the radiologist, uh, are the ones who diagnose whether the patient has dense breast or not. It's an, it's, there are four categories of breast density and a lot of times we, mention, we do mention it in the report, but patients sometimes get confused with dense breast and firmness of the breast. Sometimes they get confused with dense breast and the cup size of the bra, but the ABCD of the breast density is not related to that. So the four categories are A being mostly fatty and D being very dense. So breast is made up of glandular tissue, which is the what we call as the milk factory, um, the fat and uh, which, um, you know, which is what composes the breast and the li Cooper's ligaments or the fibrous tissue that holds it all together. Depending on the ratio of the dense and the non-dense is what we uh, categorize the mammogram as to be A, B, C, or D. And if you have category C or D breast density, we recommend a junk screening. No one test can replace the other test. So if you get a mammogram, um, that doesn't mean you can not get an MRI. These are complementary tests and mammograms people a lot of times have fear of mm -hmm. mammograms and that's why they feel maybe I could get an ultrasound instead yeah. but I think no test can replace the other test. The um, ultrasound and M uh, or MRI are complementary tests to it. So mammogram, I know um, people have heard of their breasts get squeezed and there is a lot of discomfort associated with it, but I want to emphasize that um, the reason we minimize the thickness of the breast is just so we can have we can minimize the radiation that goes through the breast and we can get better pictures to find the cancer. When it comes to category C and D breast density, it, it, the white is the dense tissue and cancer also looks white. So it could potentially mask on a mammogram and that's why we recommend additional complementary exams. And the insurance companies uh, cover these additional tests because there is a density law that has been passed in Illinois since 2000, in 2019. So, and technology has changed a little bit in that area as well, as far as just comfort levels with the test. It's it's gotten better, hasn't it? Absolutely. Great. Um, at some of our um, offsite locations, we also have smart curved paddles mm -hmm. um, that are more better. Um, they are like a shape of a breast and are yeah. better um, with the compression of yeah. the breast. Just made a, a better. Better experience. experience, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I, where I met you was at River East, that's and right. that's where we have the new, uh, the new suite there where that happens, and it's 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 a very nice uh, setup there. I think getting mammograms should be done like as uh, you know with girlfriends. Go get your manicure, pedicure, go get <laughs> your uh, mammogram, and you know, like it's a check for the year. Make it a day. Make it a day. So, is, is, so should people have them yearly then, or is there yes, an age? Yes, the recommendation is starting at the age of 40 every year. I recommend 3D mammography, um, especially for uh, category uh, C and D breast density. Um, there will be adjunct screening tools, uh, either a whole breast ultrasound or a breast MRI. And that, that age has changed uh, in recent years as well, because I remember we, we always used to talk about mammograms at the age of 45 or 50. The yeah. American, uh, you know, uh, College of Radiology, um, uh, Society of Breast Imaging, all of the um, um, organizations follow um, screening starting at the age of 40. Great. There has uh, th there has been a um, tremendous shift. I know there have been discussions in the past, but um, the interval cancers that we've seen uh, could, could lead to a lot of, those are more aggressive cancers too, and in younger women, so we prefer starting at the age of 40. Fantastic. We are out of time. Oh. That went fast. You all were great. <laughs> we really appreciate it. I don't know if you want to leave, leave us with a closing thought, in particular, you know, for maybe a woman who has been diagnosed. Uh, what would you tell her? Um, that we are here to take care of you. We're here to tell you the next steps. Make sure you, um, you know, ask the right questions. I feel sometimes people get bogged down by this is this is not the end. The live life to the fullest, just yeah. like Erica said. And uh, empower yourself, ask the right questions. Fan, any closing thoughts from you? And don't panic. 
we're, we, we're in this with you. We'll be there every step of the way. So. Great. And, and it is a, a really a wonderful team. So that's great. We are out of time. A special thanks to our physicians and experts for being with us today. And a big thank you to those of you who watched and participated in the program today. Remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs coming up in the future. To make an appointment, you can go online at uchicagomedicine.org or you can call 888-824-0200. Uh, we will leave you today with a message from one of our Chicago Sky players. I hope you have a great weekend. You know we're all about staying healthy. Getting an annual mammogram is an important part of maintaining good breast health. Mammograms can help detect breast cancer and other issues. New state-of-the-art smart curve and 3D technology has made getting mammograms more comfortable, convenient, and compassionate. This is not your mama's mammogram. To learn more and to find locations, visit the University of Chicago Medicine website. Be healthy and stay in the game together.